trails and if you're watching on YouTube welcome back to another video let's talk about first safaris I want to share my story of my first safari back in 2007 to the eastern cave of South Africa that was the very first trip we took um, and it's actually started back in 2006 my parents were wanting to build a log home and we had a log home show in Idaho and I can't remember exactly what the, the show was called or whatever you know I was 10 years old at the time you know, being 10, walking around a log home show, it wasn't quite the, you know, I liked it, I enjoyed it, but I also was kind of like, okay, what are we doing, you know? And so as we we're walking around, I see this booth, these guys were hunters, outfitters, and they're from South Africa, so I stopped and I chatted with them for a little bit, and, you know, it, it kills me that I can't remember who they were, because I'd like to either run on a hunt with them by now, or at least said thank you, um, for the, what was to come, but, uh, we sat down and was just talking. I was like, well, how old do you gotta be to hunt in you know, South Africa? Because in Wyoming, you had to be 12. And they're like, oh, you know, there's no age, you know, no age requirement. You can come as long as like your parents come with you, obviously, and you know, you can show that you can shoot. It's a free game. And I was just like, wow, well, this is epic. I wanna go because I've been, you know, biting that chomp at the bit to go hunting. And I still have two more years in the home state of Wyoming. And so, uh, you know, as we were, with my parents, and I was like, Dad, they said you don't have to have an age limit, like, we should go to Africa, and he was, you know, I don't know if he was really being serious going on, but he's like, I don't know if he was just getting annoyed at me going on about it, he's like, all right, if you can pay for the plane ticket, we'll go. Well, you know, that was in, I think, March of 2006, and so it was game on, and it was lemonades and cookies, that's what I was trying to sell during the summer, you know, it wasn't a big benefit, you know, a big profit, making business, you know, selling 50 cent lemonade or whatever it was at the time. And uh, so I wasn't really taking home the bank there. And, you know, my dentist at the time, he had been to Africa, I think three or four times by then in South Africa. And, you know, you go into his office and you have a few animals, but upstairs he had like a loft and he had a ton of his Africa stuff to actually just kind of like scattered across the ground. And I'd go in there for appointments and I'd be upstairs for like 30, 40 minutes with him. We'd be talking like, what is this? And like, he'd explain it to me, tell me stories. And I'm pretty sure the patients were pissed off about it, but he was so grateful and just, it was fun talking to him and enjoying it. And like my dad went in or my mom went in, I'd go in with them. And he'd be like, taking me around. My dad's like, just sit down, we're bugging him. And he's like, oh no, I like, you know, showing this. Most kids hate the dentist, so he can come in and look around whenever he wants. So he was part of a big inspiration in this whole deal. And, you know, we were talking to him and during this, you know, during that time in my life, I was doing 4-H a bunch, and I was doing show pigs, and I would have two show pigs, and one I would be able to sell at the county fair, I'd sell the best of the two. The other one I was actually trading with another guy to shoot a buffalo, because his mom was allergic to beef, and they raised a bunch of buffalo, so I'd give him a pig, and actually I'd give him two pigs in charge, in exchange for a buffalo, and, uh, and so it was, you know, fun doing that, and you know, during that time around here, the oil field was booming. We had Chevron and BP and lots of companies working around here. And it was pretty easy to go politic with people. And that's what I did. I went and gave free dinner and free drink tickets out to a bunch of different people and said, hey, come buy my pig. And, you know, I was actually towards the end of the night in the cell lot. And I was getting pretty nervous because I figured by now everyone already spent their money and they'd been too drunk for too long and already spent all their cash. And so I went out and I was showing my pig. And I can remember the auctioneer just you know, climbing. He was going 500, 800, 1,000, 
twelve hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, seventeen hundred bucks, two thousand, and I was just like sitting there excited the whole time. Like I could, I probably showed it. I was probably not calm, cool, and collected. I was probably just jazzed, just trying to walk the pig around the show pen, and finally sold that pig for twenty eight hundred bucks, and uh, couldn't believe it. I raced the pig back, threw him in his pen, and uh, I found out who bought the pig. I knew the lady. I ran up to her, gave her a great big hug, looked at my dad, said, "Book the trip. Let's go to Africa." So the planning process began, and uh, it took some time, you know, to plan this out. You know, we'd never been to Africa, never been anywhere else besides um, here in Wyoming. And actually, that year I was going to New Mexico for my first elk hunt because you have a youth season there, which is really special and awesome. And I was old enough to do that, but uh, we'd never been out of the country, so we of course got a hold of my dentist. He came over, talked to us. We talked to him. He said his outfitter that he'd been going with was going to be showing up into the states for the trade show season. Um, January, February, March, and then we would meet him. So he came over and we met him. Plans were set. We we're going to go to the, um, we we're going to go to the East Cape of South Africa, enjoy the trip there. The guy that worked for us to come with his family at the time. And so it was going to be a great trip. We were going to go as soon as school got out, which was typically the last week of May. So we were planning to go that first week of June. Um, and after everything was set in stone, it was like, trying to watch every African hunting video we could, which in 2007, there, you know, wasn't a whole lot. Um, there was some, but not a lot. I think Tracks Across Africa just barely started um, around 2005, 2006, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot. My, you know, my dad read a lot, and I, I wasn't much of a reader really back then. And we got books on what we could, you know, what we could of Africa. We watched everything we could. And, it was just super exciting, you know, and it was just like, okay, Jim Shockey's going, you know, you had a few other people on TV going, and it was just fun watching and the excitement built, and so it came time to leave. So, you know, I don't remember every detail of the hunt, but uh, I'll try to break down what I do remember and the parts that stuck out to me, and, you know, there's some parts in the story that could have swung us to never going back again, and I'll, I'll touch base on that here. But, uh, so, we went... And uh, we get there, I think, like June 3rd or 4th or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we get in late to eat to uh, Port Elizabeth. And then we are going to get picked up by the outfitter. And uh, some of the bags didn't show up. The guns didn't show up. And I think one baggage of clothes didn't show up between the six of us that were there. And it was kind of like, oh, what the heck? You know, we'd never been on international home. We didn't know what to expect. So my dad, outfitter, went to the, the baggage thing, did all the necessary stuff to get contacted. We loaded up. And this was, we got in late. I think we got in around eight or nine at night. And we loaded up in the truck and headed to camp, which is about an hour, um, hour from uh, Port Elizabeth. And so when we arrived in camp, uh, it was late. We got settled in. We were in nice little chalets, little separate buildings. Um, kind of looks like a bungalow, if you want to call it that, but they're chalets, separate ones for each of us. And uh, we got settled in. And, you know, it was pretty hard to fall asleep because it was just excitement because we hadn't seen any of Africa in the daylight, really. We got to Johannesburg late in the afternoon as the sun was setting. Um, only outside we saw was through the, the little window on the plane. And then when we got to Port Elizabeth, it was obviously dark. And so from there, uh, morning came and it was a super, you know, June's really starting to dive into winter in Africa and it was kind of an overcast, kind of a dreary morning, a little bit of rain, really kind of low ceiling of clouds, but I can just remember seeing like Africa come to life for the first time and it was amazing. I wish I could go back and experience that again and again because it's something that, you know, you can't, you can only experience it once. And, uh, but it was so amazing and, you know, it was day, it was starting to get daylight when we woke up and, or, when they came and got us, I think we'd been awake for a while, to be honest, because the, the jet lag or the excitement, one of the two, was just incredible. And uh, we went and had some breakfast, and as we were sitting there having breakfast, phone rang, and he was on the phone, and he comes back and says, does anyone want to shoot a caribou? African lynx. And I was like, well, yeah, let's do it. That'd be cool. And, you know, they're fairly inexpensive. It's a, it's a cat. It's a small cat, um, caracal, uh, lynx, but, you know, whatever you want to call them. There's several different names from kind of in that sense, but no, I'm just primarily known as a caracal. And uh, I'll show a photo of it right here, and I have a full video actually on my YouTube channel that you guys can see. But uh, so we load up in the truck and headed out, you know, scarf down 
I think I was having some cereal that morning. And we scarfed down that and headed down the road. And, uh, they'd already had one, the hound that had one bait already. And uh, so we get out of the truck and it was kind of like a mad dash down in there, through, going through the thick thorn bush and we were running. Like I said, it was kind of drizzling, overcast, cloudy day. And it was just like, man, we're in Africa and we're on safari and I'm gonna go shoot caracal or at least try to. Never seen any, you know, one before. And I think we passed a few different, I think we might've seen like a blessed bucker and Paul on the way there, um, just in passing, you know? And we get down there and we get to where the dogs are. And it seems like there's, it seemed like there was a hundred dogs. There were probably 10 of them there just going nuts. And they hand me an old double barrel 12 gauge, you know, 10 years old, or at the time, actually now I'm 11 during this trip. Never shot a double barrel shotgun before. So I didn't know what to expect. And I never shot a 12 gauge. Um, so point out the carrier call and I get settled in. And uh, this one had two triggers. Well, I reached up and grabbed that front trigger and when I pull it, I freaking pull all the way through and pull both triggers and both barrels of that 12 gauge go off. Um, and it's, uh, it was funny, it was comical. They're like, man, we've never seen a 12 year old or 11 year old shoot a, you know, two barrels of a 12 gauge. And I was just like, kind of like, I, you know, it didn't affect me because it was an adrenaline heat of the moment. I'm they're like, you want to shoot again? I'm like, well, the second one ain't working. I pulled both of them and they, we didn't know that. And so, uh, Carico will get him out of the tree get some pictures of him and it was like, you know, that was the first experience I had in South Africa was hunting the caribou cat and I can't, it was just an amazing experience and amazing time. You know, that only started, that was from there, it was like hook, line, and sinker. Um, like I had mentioned before, the guns hadn't showed up, so we went back to camp, got some of the outfitter's guns. I believe I was shooting a 243. Um, I think there was a 243, maybe a 270. Maybe it was a 270. And we were shooting at the range, I was dialed in. And so from there on, it was game going. And it was a fun hunt. Um, there was a lot of blessed buck and Apollo really close to where we were staying. And so we hunted them for a little bit. Um, just couldn't quite get on a blessed buck. You know, they were, every time they were a big herd. So every time I'd get on one, you know, it'd move and get lost in the herd and mixed up. And so we spent a lot of time trying to get a blessed buck. Eventually we got one. I think we all took a blessed buck on that trip, all of us that were shooting. Um, and then uh, I believe a blessed buck was the second animal we took. And then from there we went and we did Impala. We, uh, you know, we got to experience quite a bit of the Eastern Cape, especially like around the main camp. But then we traveled to some different areas. I think we, it was like a three hour drive before we went coot hunting. Uh, maybe it was only a two and a half hour drive. Uh, for when I hunted the Cape Kudu and you know a big misconception is Africa's easy I tell you what when we went into that Cape Kudu it was brutal tough we uh I think we ended up getting four bulls that day um, my dad shot two he actually shot one that's right here it's a cool bull it has a big turned down horn on it broken um we shot it just because it wasn't a trophy bull and he shot it that way but uh Man, it was tough. We spent a lot of time chasing coot. I got mine right at last light. We'd been hunting up daylight till dark on these things. And it was just, it was fun. Like, it was a true experience. And this is steep, a little short. I mean, it wasn't like massive mountains like we have here in Wyoming. But it was steep, rolling, you know, pretty good sized elevation hills. And lots of climbing rocks. It was nasty country and it was fun. Um, you know, you're glassing like you do for, you know, mule deer and elk here and it was just a challenging day um i think two shot two bulls right at last light i did and the guy that went with us and my dad shot a bull earlier in the day and then he shot the broken horn bull um later in the day or like around midday um and it was a fun hunt like i'm looking at the bull right now uh that was a fun hunt i remember stopping and getting some chips on the way early in the morning getting a meat pie um at a gas station on the way and it was just a fun experience we got up early and started driving well before daylight and the scenery quickly changed because you're still in the eastern cape but you're starting to get into some different um different terrain i believe i can't remember exactly where we went but i believe we went into the winterbergs closer into the winterberg mountains um and i've been there since hunting ball rebuck but i think we were closer to that area from where we went on the first trip and i you know i wish i probably should reach out to the, old, the outfitter i don't know if he's still even around or not, you know, I should reach out to him and say, hey, where did we go? Where did we do these kudu? You know, he would know. And it'd be cool just to have for like a story. And uh, I remember that being so fun. 
and then you know we'd get back to camp we'd have really nice evening dinners because we'd be eating the game that we just took it was a great experience that way and i mean it took i think three days to get our guns um our own guns but by then we'd already been rock and rolling with the the phs guns that they have in camp and i mean this was before long range shooting this was before anything like this is just you know your typical scope you know your off the shelf rifle and we were doing great with it back then and i think nowadays it's almost like we make it too much about the gear and not about the experience of it and you know i shot a lot of stuff with that freaking 270 and you know it was just a great time and there was some downsides to this trip the ph his wife or girlfriend at the time she would fight with him every day at like breakfast and she had her kids there and it was always like a big fight which was really weird that they would do it in front of clients and um it's pretty sad and it kind of spoiled a little bit of it because in the morning it'd be kind of rough but once we got away from her and camped it was awesome um then we actually ended up having to come back to her unfortunately but like i said the evening time was great because the meals were good we were eating tons of the game we shot you know i shot a mountain reed buck and i think mountain reed bucks probably one of the best uh plants game species over there they're all amazing i love them all elon's fantastic but on that first trip having that mountain reed buck it was just well, us to die for like i'm getting hungry just thinking about it right now um we went and did uh, black wildebeest at a different place. We shot a black wildebeest. We went to Gim's book at a different farm. And uh, we found out what jumping cactus were. Um, jumping cactus is something when you're in South Africa and certain places, especially in that area where we were on the Eastern Cape. Jumping cactus is just like a little it's a cactus. Um, I'll, put it, I'll find a picture and I'll put it up here. But uh, if you walk by it and you barely brush against it, it jumps on you and it was stuck into calves it was stuck into everywhere and pretty soon you got to where you were watching pretty heavily because you'd have to use the shooting sticks or a knife and just knock it off of your calf leg and um pant leg and stuff and it was painful but we learned what jumping cactus was we you know got to see our first aloe vera plant which makes aloe they put on you know from sunburns uh they're wildly grown over there it's kind of it's cool it's a neat plant to see we got to see so much stuff. Um, the common reed buck, impala, like I said, blessed buck. We did uh, some night hunting, which was fun. I shot a, a spring hare, which is right here, actually. I'll pick it up and show you. This is an old mount, but here's what my spring hare looks like. And the funny story on the spring hares, we had a, a Jack Russell, and his name was Juba. And I shot the spring hair with this 22, and he was bouncing. He went in the hole. Well, Juba went down the hole with him, and he was trying to pull the spring hair out, but he couldn't. So the guy that was with us that worked for us, he was a houndsman, and he was all into this. And he walked up, and he grabbed Juba by the back legs and was pulling this Juba out that had a hold of the spring hair. Uh, it was pretty comical. We got a good laugh out of that. Shot a Janet, and I shot a, a Southern Bush Diker as well at night. And that was, that was an extremely fun time just to get out and experience a different – different diversity of you know south africa um you know it's very it's very easy on your first safari to do a lot of shooting because it's brand new to you um you know whether you have a you know want to shoot a bunch of like the, the smaller end stuff or you want to shoot a few big animals it's it's wide open for you you know and you know you get a lot of shooting on those first trips you can easily do a couple animals a day on the first safari you know because like i said it's your first trip and if you're in a good area you know, we were, we never shot anything off the truck. We were always walking, spot and stock. Like I said, it took us time to get a blessed buck. I think it took us two or three days to get a blessed buck. We were seeing tons of it's just, you know, being, me being 11 years old and I wasn't as quick on the gun at the time. It just takes time and there's just opportunity there. And, uh, it just, it's just, there's so much to offer on that first safari that it's, uh, it's hard to describe. Like if I could go back and review my first safari just to get that experience again, I would. And so we did that. We did Bless Buck, Paula, Gems Buck, Kudu. And so, like I said, we did the Night Critters, um, Mountain Reed Buck, Common Reed Buck. And uh, it was a great trip. And before, right before the end of the trip, I actually got to shoot a really, really nice Cape Bush Buck, a really big ram close to camp. And that was pretty, that was icing on the cake because, you know, now I'm a huge lover of the spiral horns, but before then I, you know, I was 
a lover of the spiral hunt, but not as in-depth as I am now. And I thought a bush buck was just the coolest animal ever. And we'd hunted quite a few of them. Like I said, this wasn't just gimme hunting. A lot of it was, you know, low fence stuff. There was some high fence stuff, but in the Eastern Cape, you get a lot of mixed options, which is really cool. And the areas that were high fence, they were big areas. Um, and it was to keep blessed buck and bond buck separate, keep certain species separate. And it was just, it was pretty cool that way to learn about why and the, and the benefits of the high fence hunting in Africa and the benefits it's done to bring back a lot of animals. And I, I'll do a separate video to cover that because um, it's a real conservation story. A lot of that stuff was nearly wiped out and there was no value in it. But like I said, there's a lot of great free range stuff in that Eastern Cape. Um, and that bush buck was, you know, free range cattle. Cattle and sheep and goats. There's a lot of sheep and goats actually down there. A lot more sheep and goats throughout that area than there is cattle where we were. And uh, yeah, we were hunting in the mix of all the goats and the sheep. And it was cool just to experience that. And yeah, just going on that first safari was something special. We spent a couple, we spent, I think maybe it was just a day. I went to Addo Elephant Park, which was super cool. We saw lions there. We saw a rhino. We saw an elephant, obviously, because it's Addo Elephant Park. Uh, warthog, kudu, it was just, it was extremely cool to have a day of touring around um, the national park and just add it to that first experience. But as I've said a hundred times, like I wish I could go back and get that, relive that first experience because it's uh, something you can't match. You cannot match a first experience in South Africa or Africa period. And, uh, you know, the kudu hunting was great. The bush buck hunting was great. The, the hunt in the, the reed buck was a spectacular hunt because it was all different, but it was all similar in the same way we'd spend time glassing, spotting stock, we'd sit on ridges, especially for like the mountain reed buck and for the bush buck and kuda, we'd hunt just like we do here in North, you know, the, the western part of North America for our meal during our elk. It was a very similar hunt, just totally different continent and totally different country. And the food is spectacular. You'll, you'll, I've been to a lot of North American hunting camps and you don't get the same treatment you get um, as far as like the food and the service wise from the staff as you do on an African safari. Um, you know, we used to lease a big part, a sublease part of a, a property here that came with a big lodge and we had a chef and stuff, but um, there were some ladies cooking there, but it still didn't hold a candle to what a, a true African experience is like um, as far as food goes and accommodations and the staff, just a full experience, you know. First off, we lost our guns and some gear. We had some issues with the, the outfitter's current girlfriend at the time. You know, little hiccups like that, but it, for the most part, it was a an enjoyable experience. And, you know, a lot of people could have got turned down by the, the fact that they, the rifles didn't show up. And, you know, I know people that have, but, you know, I think it just kind of, we didn't know what to expect. So we didn't go into it expecting a whole lot. And there wasn't a lot, like I said, there wasn't a lot of books. There was more books, but there wasn't a lot of TV shows. There definitely wasn't a lot of YouTube videos about the subject. So it wasn't like we knew what to expect. So when the guns and show were like, well, this is probably just normal, apparently, you know. And because our outfitter had rifles for us to use um, as we waited. So it was like, you know, it's not the end of the world. Let's uh, let's just shoot these rifles and when our show of our show up. And that's just how we, we rolled the punches. And it was so fun and exciting. And, you know, like I said, I wish I could remember the, the outfitter that... I talked to at that log home show because they got me so jacked up and so excited to go to Africa and, you know, having been 16 times on 16 different safaris, uh, I feel like I owe them a thank you. And if I could remember and figure out who they were, I would, you know, if they're still in business, I'd love to go on a safari with them just to, just to say thank you. And this is, you guys got me hooked on this. You guys made it, you know, a thought in my mind. You guys gave me the knowledge to want to do this and then. You know, my dad said, book the trip. You know, if they can get the money for the plane ticket, we're going. You know, ever since then, it's just been like, well, what can I do to, you know, do a little bit of extra here, get a little extra money this way, try to try to work this way, and just make it make it part of, you know, Africa. Going to Africa is my number one priority, really. Um, outside of my dog and family, it's like hunting's my thing. And so um, that's kind of what it's been. I can't wait to go to Africa this year, heading back. I'm going to go three different safaris back to back and experience some different stuff and hunt with some new people, um, hunt a few key species I haven't done. And then, you know, it's always, it's always a kudu hunt. You're always looking for a bigger kudu or a, just a good representation of a kudu. Always looking for a nice bush buck um, where they're found. If you see a big young buck, you know, it's just to me, it's I'm not a one and done. I like to experience it. I like to hunt it all. Um, I love eating the, the wild game over there. And it's just, it's all about the, 
the adventure and the experience you have while on safari. So that was the experience of my first Africa hunt, and uh, it's something that has ruined me, and also something that I'm grateful for because it has cost me a lot of money, and it's made me an addictive person to Africa. But uh, it showed me a lot more of this world than going to school and seeing on TV can ever do. And I've made some absolutely amazing friends over there on that continent, whether it's South Africa, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Tanzania, I have some amazing friends over there. And uh, if you're sitting on the fence about going on a safari, I think you should get off the fence and go. Because it is hands down, best bang for your buck experience that you can ever have. And uh, you will not regret going with a reputable outfitter and having a great time. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Safari Trails. Um, I'm going to start going in and breaking down past hunts and giving you guys some more in-depth on what I've experienced, how I've done on hunts, who I went with, and stuff like that as well. And uh, I'm going to be sharing a lot more through the Sim Safari Instagram page, uploading more content through simsafaris.com, and just sharing my passion for Africa, trying to show you guys what to expect and the ins and outs of hunting Africa. So thank you guys. Hope you subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend. And until next time, happy hunting and good luck on that first safari.